Dear audience, thank you very much for your interest in JungleNet, a convolutional neural network which not only classifies but also provides interpretable information about its decisions on wilderness. I am Timo Stomberg and today I present you the work of Emanuel Weber and me. We got also great support from Professor Michael Schmidt and Professor Rivan Rosha. So let's now begin with this talk JungleNet, using explainable machine learning to gain new insights into the appearance of wilderness in satellite imagery. Before discussing the methodology, let's try to get a better understanding of the term wilderness. Actually, it's not even easy to give you a clear definition since wilderness is an abstract concept and there is no clear physical definition of what makes nature wild. Let's have a look to some examples. What you see here are three satellite images from Sentinel-2. The upper one shows the nature reserve Sjaunia in Sweden. Sjaunia is a very large and strictly protected area, which is basically completely unaffected by human influence. So this is probably the epitome of wilderness. The second image shows Berlin, the German capital city, which is obviously a clear non-wilderness sample. But then there's, for example, the Black Forest National Park in Germany. Here, nature is protected on the one hand, but on the other hand, there are still some settlements and infrastructure as streets and trails. So, is this no wilderness? There are multiple definitions, and one of them is held by the International Union for Conservation of Nature, short IUCN. But this definition of wilderness is actually not clear at all. Usually large, slightly modified areas without significant human habitation these are no numbers you can easily assign. What does retaining their natural character actually mean? And then there's protected. So are unprotected areas that fulfill all the other conditions not wild? But to be honest, we are not so interested in constructed definitions. We want to deepen our understanding of what makes nature wild. And this is exactly the challenge. How can we learn something about a phenomenon that is only weakly defined. Well, at least we have access to IUCN wilderness data, since IUCN provides such data according to their definition. And we can export satellite images from Sentinel-2 within these areas. We can also export satellite images within non-wide natural areas and cities. And then having both data in wide regions and data in non-wide regions, we could start training a machine learning model for scene classification. But since we only have weak labels, there occur some problems with this simple workflow. Our ISCN wilderness samples may include some images which show human activities. And on the other hand, we cannot rule out that there are some actual wilderness samples in our non iucn wilderness dataset. So, our annotation is noise prone, and therefore the accuracy of our mapping is limited. That's why our machine learning model must also provide interpretable information. And then, with an interpretable machine learning model, we do not analyze the classification results themselves. In fact, we analyze how the model makes its decisions. Here's our interpretable deep neural network which we call JungleNet. It consists of two well-known convolutional neural networks. The first one is a UNet, and the second one is a ResNet-18. A UNet consists of an encoder-decoder structure and is mostly used for segmentation tasks since the output map has the same height and width as the input image. And a ResNet is a residual neural network which is often used for image classification. For implementation to JungleNet, we had to adjust the UNet so that it takes multidimensional images and outputs two activation maps. These activation maps are passed to the ResNet, which classifies into IUCN wilderness and non-IUCN wilderness. As you might already imagine, the UNet activation maps are the key for interpretability. I'm going to explain the methodology in detail here and after. But to summarize it beforehand, we cluster the unit activation maps 
to find potential concepts. And then we occlude these potential concepts, put them into the ResNet again, and analyze the results to see if these concepts are sensitive towards wilderness or non-wilderness. So now let's go more into detail. What you see here is an input image shown with its red, green, blue channels. And you also see both unit activation maps, where blue means negative and red means positive values. As you can see, there are many structures you can find in both the input image and the activation maps. But there are also a lot of differences. And so to interpret these activation maps, we transform them to a two-dimensional heat map. Let me show you how this works. At this position, the first activation map is colored red, which means a positive value. Let's say this value is about 0.7. And the second activation map is light blue, which means slightly negative, let's say minus 0.4. The arrows show you where this single position enters the heat map. And we do that for all positions and for all correctly classified test samples. And this way, we get this heat map at the end. We now use expectation maximization to find three clusters within this heat map. Each cluster is defined by a Gaussian mixture distribution, and this allows us to allocate each position in the activation maps to one of the three clusters. In this case, our sample position would go to the magenta cluster. And since activation maps and input image have the same spatial extent, we can assign the corresponding position in the input image to the magenta cluster. When we do exactly that for all pixels, we get an allocation to the three clusters as shown here. We then call these three clusters potential concepts. For example, you can see that here the settlements are mainly assigned to the blue concept. One could now assume that the blue concept is connected to the non-wilderness class, but we need to find out if JanaNet also treats the blue concept as non-white. So, I come back to this workflow, which you have seen before, but now I show it with our one specific sample. Again, starting from the beginning, we pass our input image into the unit to get activation maps. And then we pass these activation maps to the ResNet to get classification scores. For this sample, JungleNet predicts a value of 0.8 for non-wilderness and 0.16 for wilderness. So a clear decision for non-wilderness. At the bottom, you see the potential concepts we found for this sample. Let's now find out if the blue concept is sensitive. To do so, we occlude the blue concept in the activation maps, and then we pass them through the ResNet. Now the prediction values are 0.1 and 0.89, so they strongly change towards a decision for wilderness, with a deviation of 0.7 in both categories. An experiment with one single sample is not very meaningful. Therefore, we repeat this experiment with all correctly classified test samples and put the deviations into a histogram. What we see in this histogram is that when occluding the blue concept, the non-wilderness classification score, here in gray, decreases. And at the same time, the wilderness classification score, here in gray, increases. And this is given for basically all test samples. So we can say that the blue concept is strongly sensitive towards non-wilderness. And of course, we can do the same for the other two concepts. The magenta one is also strongly sensitive towards non-wilderness, similar to the blue concept. And for the yellow concept, we see that this one is slightly sensitive towards wilderness, so the other way around, but not as distinct as the other ones. To conclude this talk, wilderness is a weakly defined phenomenon, and we want to solve the question, what makes nature wild? I present a jungle net, which is an interpretable neural network and allows to find sensitive concepts for wilderness and non-wilderness. And with that, I thank you for your attention. If you are more interested in this topic, have a look at our paper, and if you have any questions or want to exchange ideas, you're welcome to contact me anytime via this email address.